Tonight I'm speaking on the subject, what does the Bible say about the second coming of Jesus Christ? And I'm reading out of the 24th chapter of Matthew, one of the classic prophecy passages in the gospel. And I'm going down to verse 36 and reading down through verse 44. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings. Right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Pause right there. You know, the great theologians through the years have often agreed, read the Bible and take it literally unless it tells you differently. Now, of course, there are proper ways and hermeneutics of interpreting Scripture. And I am certainly not saying this is literal mathematical equation. But I've often wondered, what if half of those who think they're ready or not what if half who claim to be Christians were left behind? Because, and again, I'm not trying to exegete something that isn't in Scripture. But I do believe that it's a warning that warrants self-inspection. Because, and don't miss this, the Bible condemns self-doubt. We should not be preaching in such a way to leave people in doubt about where they stand with God. I heard one notable preacher some time ago on TV make the statement, well, I guess supposedly we can't be absolutely sure until we make heaven our home. Until then, I guess by God's grace, we have to live in faith the best we can and leave everything else up to the mercy of the Lord. That, my friend, is a violation of the Bible. Because the Bible said that you can be sure of your salvation. That you might know. There is a no-so in the Bible about being ready for end-time events. And the Bible condemns self-doubt. But the Bible commends self-examination. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians said, examine your faith to see if it is genuine. Examine your faith to see if it is real. And if you're listening to me tonight and you are not sure that you're ready to meet the Lord, when I'm done, I'm going to challenge you to pray with me. Because I don't want you to leave with an I think so in your heart. I don't want you to leave with an I hope so in your heart. I believe there is a place in God through faith and repentance and the scripture where a person can say, I know that I know that I know that I have repented of my sins. I have received Jesus Christ and I am ready to go. How many would like to lay your head to the pillow every night with an I know so in your spirit? Can I hear a good amen? amen. Verse 42, so you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come 
when least expected. And that, my friend, is one of the most powerful things about Bible prophecy, eschatology, end time events. How do you face such trying, chaotic, global times? You live ready every day. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Those of you that may be watching online, I have no way of knowing how far this will go. But are you ready? Are you living ready to meet the Lord? Are you living in victory over sin? Or is sin living in victory over you? If you're the worst sinner within the sound of my voice, this preacher is not here tonight to condemn you or to place guilt upon you, but to help you. If you're the worst sinner within the sound of my voice, I am not your judge. I am your best friend. I have dedicated my life to helping sinners find their way to right relationship with God. And in the moments to come when I'm done, I'd like the privilege of praying with you. And you can pray with me what many people call a sinner's prayer. If you don't know how to pray, if it comes from a sincere heart, then the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you'll be patient in the moments to come, you can have a life-changing experience and place your hand in the hand of Christ who died and he alone died for you. And if we love and appreciate all that might be viewing online, let them hear the applause of God from his precious people. There are many that debate that the most climatic event in all of human history, will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. When the Bible describes that God's only Son, Jesus Christ, not as the crucified Lamb of God, but as the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, will return to this earth to establish His eternal kingdom. And there's nothing more clearly stated in all of the Bible than the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. There is no way to disagree with the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is so found throughout the scriptures that no true Bible believer, regardless of denomination, it is the one piece of eschatology, it is the one piece of end time study that all agree upon. Not all denominations agree upon certain and specifics about how the chronology of Bible prophecy will unfold. But every major denomination does not budge on this statement because you'd have to rip so much of your Bible out to discard it. It is found throughout the Bible over 400 times we are promised the second coming of Jesus Christ. Scholars have identified 1,845 biblical references to the second coming of Jesus Christ in the entirety of the Bible. The Old Testament contains several references to the second coming of Christ. In 17 of those 39 Old Testament books, the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus Christ was actually mentioned by Enoch, a man in the infancy of the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, taught us the second coming of Jesus Christ. Think of it. Before the Bible was written, before the world was destroyed by the flood, before God's covenant to Abraham and centuries before the birth of the Messiah, Enoch was proclaiming that Jesus Christ would return again. In Jude chapter 1 verses 14 and 15, the Bible said Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, quote, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment 
on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch was proclaiming and prophesying the second coming of Jesus Christ, prophesying in such detail that he even nailed the part of eschatology that the second coming is Christ returning with his saints. The rapture of the church is Christ returning for his saints. But the second coming of Jesus Christ is Christ returning with his saints. And we will rule and reign with him throughout countless ages as the redeemed of the Lord because of the work of the cross, because of the shed blood, because of his resurrection, because of his ascension, and because of his promise, and because the Bible promises us so. People are oftentimes surprised to learn that references to the second coming of Christ outnumber references to his first coming, eight to one. In the New Testament, 23 of the 27 books mention the literal and visible return of Jesus Christ in the second coming. Three of the remaining four books are one-chapter books, Philemon, 2 John, and 3 John. And the book of Galatians implies the second coming in Galatians 1 and 4. Seven out of ten chapters in the New Testament mention his second coming. One out of every 30 verses in the New Testament teaches us that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament and over 300 references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself promised his return 21 times. In Matthew 26 and 64, Jesus replied, You have said it, and in the future you will see. The Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Christians are warned in the New Testament 50 times to be ready for his second coming. The first time Jesus came to this earth, he appeared as an innocent baby in obscurity. But in his second coming, he will return for the entire world will witness his return. We read of it in Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven. Hallelujah. And everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes and amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. I am the one who is, the one who always was, and the one who is still to come, the Almighty One. If you're looking forward to the return of the Almighty One, give him a mighty hand of praise in the house of the Lord. I've been encouraged by all of those that I see taking notes and blistered fingers from trying to keep up with my pace of preaching. But I'll try to slow down enough. Every now and then I hear my wife's voice in the back of my head. Tiff, please slow down. You've preached on this your whole life. You need to understand that sometimes listening to you to preach on eschatology and Bible prophecy is like a baby trying to get a sip of water out of a fire hydrant. So I'll do my best to heed her voice that I think I heard just not moments ago. If you're taking notes, number one, where? The place of the second coming, where? Where? In the second coming, the Bible says Jesus will return to this earth to the exact geographical location from where he left. Did you know that? The last place the feet of Jesus touched on earth will be the identical geographic place where his feet touch in the second coming. And that location in the Bible is the Mount of Olives. There are multiple passages in the Bible that help us concerning this geographical location. 
Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move towards the north and half toward the south. And there are many other passages that declare the exact GPS location of the feet of Jesus, nail-pierced and scarred, will touch the Mount of Olives. That answers where? Question number two, who? The people who will accompany him in the second coming. Who? When Jesus Christ returns from heaven to destroy the Antichrist, to judge the nations, to establish his glorious kingdom upon this earth. The Bible is clear about this. He's not coming back alone. He will be accompanied by a great crowd, and this crowd will follow in his entourage as he splits the clouds, the Bible tells us, riding on a white stallion. The crowd will be made up not only of the redeemed of the Lord, but the crowd will also be made up of the mighty warning angels of heaven. Christ will return with the angels of heaven robed for war along with all of the saints and the redeemed in white garments ready to establish his forever kingdom as we prepare for the millennium. And the Bible tells us that the Antichrist and all of the powers of this earth, the unholy trinity referenced in Revelation 13, the beast which is Satan, the false prophet which is the Antichrist, or the first beast which is the Antichrist and the false prophet which is the second beast. That unholy trinity that will wage war against the things of God. There will not be a world war to stop them. There will not be the dropping of a nuclear bomb to stop them. But the Bible tells us in the glory of his appearance and by the words of his mouth just as God created this earth the mouth of God will destroy the opponents of God. God as his children take their rightful place. There's a lot of debate about the rapture, I know. And some people say those who are premillennialists believe in two comings, which is not doctrinally accurate. We believe in one coming in two phases. The rapture is the extraction of the redeemed, the end of the church age, an exclamation point of God fulfilling Daniel's prophecy that the church age was for a limited time, a prophetic pause, extracted before the tribulation. And Revelation is clear that the believers are not going through the tribulation. Revelation 3 and Verse 10, the Bible says, because you endured, because you persevered, I will keep you from this hour of testing that is coming upon the whole earth. The Bible didn't say to those who are the redeemed because Revelation 1, 2, and 3 is God speaking to the church. John the Revelator who penned the words, as we walk through the church in the first three chapters, in the 22nd verse of Revelation 3, there is never a mention of the church again after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. The tribulation period begins its march in Revelation 6 and ends in Revelation 19. The church is never mentioned after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. It's mentioned 19 times up through Revelation 1, 2, and 3 until that 22nd verse. But it is never mentioned again until the final salutation of the final chapter and the final words of the final paragraph of that book. Why isn't the church mentioned in Revelation 6 through 19 through the birth and the introduction and the fulfillment of the tribulation? and the judgments of God. Why? Because the church isn't there. 
Revelation 3.10 tells us why there's no mention after 3.22. Because you endured. Some translations, because you persevered. Because you were faithful in your consecration. I will keep you. Now remember, those words are to the church. I will keep you from this hour of testing that is coming upon the whole world. He didn't say, I'll keep you in it. He didn't say, I'll keep you through it. He said, I'll keep you from it. And that is a perfect rendering from the original Greek. Every born-again believer will be raptured before the tribulation. If you have more questions on that, I have 51-hour studies and 50 reasons why biblically and doctrinally the church cannot go through the tribulation. Go to our YouTube channel and knock yourself out. All believers in Christ have a round-trip ticket. The rapture is literally a round-trip ticket. It is Christ coming for us, but in the second coming, we will return with him. Revelation 19, 11 through 14, Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses." We've answered the question of the second coming doctrinally where. We've answered the doctrinal question who. Number three, we answer the doctrinal question why. What is the purpose of his second coming? I don't have time to carve all of the meat off of this bone, and I hope that you understand that in a setting such as this, I cannot do an exhaustive doctrinal study on any subject in one setting. That is not my endeavor. I hope your hunger for the Bible will continue to lead you in those ways. And I hope that perhaps the Lord will allow me the opportunity to be a respected voice in these last days to study Bible prophecy with. As of last numbers that I've seen in the reports on my desk, somewhere between three and 400,000 people in over 100 nations of the world study the Bible with us every month just on our YouTube channel. And many are looking in these last days for a trusted voice that they can open the Bible with and learn what the Scripture says about the chronology of the end times, not by somebody's political bent, not by somebody's denominational bent, but by the simple purity of what the Bible has to say. Why the purposes of his second coming? Let me just give you seven and then we'll pray. Number one, Christ is coming to fulfill his promise. The coming of Christ to earth will fulfill his numerous promises and the Bible's numerous promises that he will come again. Matthew chapter 25 verse 31, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. Number two, Christ is coming to defeat the Antichrist and his armies. Revelation 19, 19, then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies were gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who had worshipped his statue. Both the beast and the false prophet 
were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. This is Christ. And the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. Jesus is coming to crush the gathered horde at Armageddon who is under the authority of the Antichrist. In a futile, foolish show of bravado, the assembled armies will turn against Christ as he discerns returns from heaven and it'll be the briefest battle in history the king of kings and the lord of lords will prevail effortlessly number three Christ is coming to regather and restore faithful Israel as I have taught you before I remind you again do not ever forget that Bible prophecy revolves around God's covenant to Israel and to the Jews, not to the Republicans and the Democrats, nor the White House. Sadly, and I do not say this with any glee whatsoever, but sadly, America is suspiciously absent from final Bible prophecy. And though we do not know all of the details, we do know what is going to happen, not only to America, but to all nations. Revelation 13 tells us that when the tribulation is in process and the Antichrist is elevated to a position of global leadership, Revelation 13 gives us the five political agendas of the last days. A one world government, a one world leader, a one world monetary system, a one world religion, and a one world military to enforce brutally the mandates. Don't ever forget this. You should not have any hope in end time politics, including our own. Because the Bible is very clear that in the last days, political leaders are headed for a global stage. And the spirit of Antichrist is upon global leaders and luminaries who are not even the Antichrist. That's why the Bible teaches us in 1 John that there are Antichrists, plural, small a. But then the Bible defines an Antichrist, singular, capital A. And it's one of the common questions that comes in from our viewers and our followers and our podcast channel, etc. Why does the Bible contradict itself in saying Antichrist plural and then Antichrist singular? Let me answer that. Matthew 24, 36. No man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Always remember this. Only the Father has the fulfilled knowledge of the chronology of Bible prophecy and end time events. Now Jesus said that. There's debate among scholarship that only the Father had it, that it was kept from Christ. But I believe the proper understanding of that is when Jesus ascended back to heaven and back to his rightful order, the full knowledge of the Father became the full knowledge of the Son. But I'm not here to entertain that off-debated subject. But what I am going to state clearly to you is that the devil has no idea when these things are going to happen. The false prophet has no idea when these things are going to happen. The Antichrist has has no idea when these things are going to happen. And because Satan, who is the dragon of Revelation, has no idea as to when these things are going to happen because the rapture is a signless event, he has always had to have had an Antichrist waiting in the wings. Thus Antichrist, plural, small a. He knows the chronology of end times as much as we do by the access of Scripture. But he does not know the moment of the rapture for it is a signless event. So he has to have political people in the wings ready to be the Antichrist. God knows who the Antichrist, capital A, will be. 
because he knows all from the foundations of the earth. But don't ever forget it. The devil is a created being. An angel created by God. And the creation never has the power of the creator. And too many people enlarge the capabilities of the devil. He has no power over the believer. He has no power over the blood washed. He has no power over the sword of the spirit. He has no power over a life built upon the Bible. He only has the power that fear allows him to have. He has power, don't misquote me. He has mighty power, but only over the curse of sin and all who are still underneath that curse. But I have good news for you tonight. The Christ of Calvary came to break the curse of sin. And he came to break the curse of sickness. And he came to break the curse of lack. And he came to break the curse of poverty. The curse of sin will steal and kill and destroy. But the blood-washed believer comes into a new covenant where you are no longer subservient to the powers of sin and the curses of sin. You rise into a relationship with your heavenly Father. And you are now, as a believer, a son of of God or a daughter of God and filled with his precious Holy Spirit with a divine appointment for greatness in the millennium. That's why you hear me say you need to live carefully now because God is watching how you live now before the rapture because it determines your position and your responsibilities in the millennium. You are in training time for reigning time. Students, hear me again in my final message on this trip. You are not in training time after you graduate and enter the ministry. You are in training time by every ounce of character you show now. This is training time for reigning time. For the Bible says in the second coming of Christ with the angels of the Lord and the redeemed of the Lord, we will rule and reign in the millennium as we prepare for the fulfillment of his eternal kingdom. Can I hear a good amen? amen. The most frequently mentioned promise in the Old Testament is that God's promise to restore Israel and the nation of Israel dominates all. When you get a chance, listen to one of my videos entitled, The Super Sign of Bible Prophecy. What is the super sign of Bible prophecy? The regathering of the nation of Israel as a sign of the soon coming of the Lord by means of rapture. I don't have time to go through the entirety of its history. Of course, many of you might know that Israel has been dispersed on two separate occasions, A.D. 70 by Titus and the Romans, again in A.D. 135, dispersed to the four corners of the globe, never to be regathered, so it seemed. But God's covenant with Israel said that two magnanimous things would mark like signposts on a road. Though we don't know the moment of the rapture, Jesus said in Matthew 24, you'll know when it's nigh, even at the door. So there are some signposts before the rapture. But there is not a visible exit until the trumpet sounds. But the super sign on the road to the rapture is this promise to the nation of Israel and to the Jews. Number one, he said they would be reborn as a nation. The prophet Ezekiel said, is it possible for a nation to be born in a single day? And on May 14, 1948, in about 11 minute span of time, that's exactly what transpired. Israel became a recognized nation. In less than a day, exactly as Bible prophecy had spoken. So when Israel became a nation, and again, great debate in Matthew 24, 
But many believe that those who witness the rebirth of the nation of Israel, this generation shall not pass until all of these things are fulfilled. And again, hotly debated. Some would say it really wasn't until 1967 until Jerusalem was brought in. But anyway, you cut that doctrinal debate. You have lived long enough to be a part of the final moments of human history as we know it. I don't know the moment of the rapture. I just know that it's 1159.59 on the prophetic calendar of God. And I say to you, as I said earlier in the message, you need to obey the challenge of Christ. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He, by means of rapture, is coming very soon. But the second major sign, and this is oftentimes called the super sign, is that God supernaturally, prior to the rapture, would regather the nation of Israel with its rightful Jewish population. And though I, in another message, outline this in irrefutable detail, let me just give you one specific date, and that date is 2009. Why is 2009 such an important date in Bible prophecy? Because for the first time, don't miss this, for the first time since A.D. 135, 2009 marked a date where there were more Jews living in Israel than anywhere in the world. The second highest population at that time was in America, about 5.2 million Jews. The bulk of the rest of the Jews in the world in 2009 now were down to less than 13%. Let me give you something a little closer to home. The battle of Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine had high Jewish populace. And in the invasion by Vladimir Putin, if you'll remember the news, the airport's in Ukraine were jammed with thousands of people like ants inside the building and outside the building but what the news didn't tell you was the bulk of those were Jews and Jewish families trying to get to Israel many of them believed that they were beginning to witness the fulfillment of the prophet Ezekiel in his chapters uh, Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 where Ezekiel prophesied that in the last days there would arise a lustful, angry, arrogant leader out of Rosh, R-O-S-H. Rosh in Bible prophecy is Russia. There is no debate among that with any scholarship because the prophet said the land due north of Israel and there is only one major landmass due north of Israel that meets that fulfillment, and it's Russia. And that's provable through much more detail than I'll not take the time to articulate. Moscow is almost due north of Jerusalem. And the Bible said that in the last days, an aggressive leader would arise out of Rosh. It's called the Battle of Gog and Magog. Gog is a person, Magog is a place. Gog is a person, Magog is a place. In reading Ezekiel 38 and 39, mark that as a note in your Bible. Gog is a person, Magog is a place. I'm not saying Vladimir Putin is the fulfillment of Gog. All I am saying is that Ezekiel said there would be an aggressive leader out of the land of Rosh with a desire to reestablish what we may consider the Russian Empire and in doing so, Jews would be driven back to Israel in mass. We're watching what seems to be the potential fulfillment of that. But now, the Jews in Israel approach 7 million. And the Jews, by their own proclamation, have said in even the last few days, the leading rabbinical voice in Jerusalem, days ago, I watched it on a news press release. He said, and it was translated from Hebrew for the press conference and for those that were getting this in English, 
But it was translated saying this, we are convinced that the return of the Messiah could take place at any moment. I saw a video last night before I closed my eyes because I follow a lot of Jerusalem information and Israeli information and Jerusalem Post and the Temple Institute and so on. But it was a picture near the Western Wall and people were there shoulder to shoulder by the multiplied thousands spilling over into other areas and they were singing in Hebrew about their anticipation of the soon return of their Messiah. They will not be surprised by the return of the Messiah, but they will be surprised by the identity of the Messiah. That rabbi went on to say when asked about the rebuilding of the third temple, he said, within four hours we are now prepared. Don't miss this. The Temple Institute, which has been in operation for quite some time now, has fulfilled all of their assignments. The Sanhedrin is now functional. All of the garments are made. All of the vessels are made. The table of showbread is made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As a matter of fact, the menorah, the gold menorah prophesied for that third temple was recently donated out of pure gold worth millions of dollars. Guess who donated it? Jews from Ukraine. Delivered to Jerusalem, Israel not long ago. Everything is ready for the third temple. But that rabbi made the statement, we have the temple ready to be built and assembled, and I've heard many, and, and there are some again that debate this, but I've heard that everything for the third temple is already cut, already carved, already ready for pre-assembly. But that rabbi said to fulfill the law, we can use the tabernacle of Moses, and we will erect the tabernacle of Moses. We've practiced we can now do it in less than four hours and begin animal sacrifices to fulfill the laws of Judaism within four hours. The fulfillment of the red heifer has taken place in recent days. Listen to me when I say this and we're going to pray. There is nothing holding back the rapture of the church. And if these things that are going to transpire during the seven years of tribulation are already on the stage and ready for the curtain to be drawn, then how much closer must we be to the rapture of the church? Isaiah 43, verses 5 through 7. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from east and west, I will say to the north and south, bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. And then we have the fourth reason. Christ is coming to judge the living. When Christ returns, all Gentiles who survived the tribulation will appear before him and be in that judgment, determined as to who can enter the kingdom. And then number five, the Bible tells us Christ is coming to resurrect the dead. Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or on their hands. By the way, uh, not get into it, but the mark will not be under the skin or in the skin. It will be on the skin, visible and literal. Make note of that every student. The mark of the beast is visible and literal. The Greek word is epi, and it is translated and rendered properly on the skin. One older version in one passage says in, but that version is inconsistent in its application. 
on just one occasion it says in concerning the mark, but in every other occasion the translators for some reason debated, translated it on. But the proper understanding of the mark of the beast, it is not in the skin, it is not under the skin, it will not be that micro-grain, rice-sized piece of technology that's been on YouTube for six years. It's not going to be a, a, a under the skin some type of e-tattoo, which is new technology. As a matter of fact, you should never worry about the mark of the beast because it's not even implemented until halfway through the tribulation when the Antichrist desecrates the Holy of Holies as called the abomination of desolation. Point being this, don't miss it. No born-again, blood-washed, holy-living, ready believer will ever meet the Antichrist or be subjected to the choice of the mark of the beast. Christ is coming to bind the devil. Revelation 21 through 3, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan. I was preaching one time and I was describing the unholy trinity of Revelation 13 revealed for the first time. And I said the dragon is Satan. The first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. Somebody came to me after the uh, meeting and said, you know, I really feel that you shared some heresy tonight that I feel led to correct you upon. And so... Uh, even though I wanted to grab him by the throat, I stood there graciously as they read that and said, you added words to the Bible, and the Bible says if you add words to the Bible that your name will be taken from the Lamb's book. And so I let them rattle on. And trust me, you will meet many people in your ministry with IQs less than room temperature. Be gracious as best as you can. So after they were done, I said, open your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. He sees the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan. The Bible defines the dragon as Satan. So I said, let me just give you a little bit of loving advice. The next time you arrogantly come to a platform and attack your pastor or a guest speaker, or anyone in ministry who perhaps has been in ministry and studied the scriptures and came to that platform prepared, you might want to think twice. How many of you believe that the Bible cannot lie? Bound Satan in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. That's the millennium. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. And lastly, Christ is coming to establish himself as king. Revelation 19 and 16. On his robe, at his thigh, was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. When Christ returns, he returns as King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. He will sit on his glorious throne in Jerusalem, and from that place he will reign over all the earth. You know what's so exciting about eschatology for me? One of my favorite passages. The Bible said there is coming a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is right with God. There's coming a second coming. There are coming a series of seven judgments. There is coming a judgment of all of the ungodly. But when the dust of all end time and prophetic eschatology ends, there is coming a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is right with God and he shall reign forever and forever. And all who want to live ready for the soon return, all who want to return with him in the second coming, will you stand to your feet and as a token before God to say, I believe and I receive, give him a thundering applause of praise for he is coming 
very soon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, praise him. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Soon coming King. May we all live ready. Thank you, Father. I never preach the gospel without giving people an opportunity to receive Christ. And I have no idea as to how many may end up watching online or from some platform, maybe listening to a podcast, driving down a highway, sitting in a hotel. I have no way of knowing. But this preacher really loves you, as does the Lord. And you have a brief window of opportunity. And there are only two things you can do with Jesus Christ. You can receive him or you can reject him. One of the most common questions that comes into our ministry, and there probably are some that are watching now, who if we had a chance to go out for a coffee in the moments to come, your question might be, Tiff, what do I have to do? How can I be sure that in these last days that I'm right with God, that my sins are forgiven, that I'm ready to go? Receiving Christ is as simple as A, B, C. A, the Bible says you have to admit your sins. Proverbs said whoever conceals their sins will never prosper, but whoever confesses them and renounces them will receive mercy. B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Not just believe he existed. Believe he loves you. Believe he was the son of God. Believe he died upon the cross for sinners. Believe he rose again. In childlike faith, believe the blood he shed can make you as white and as pure and as holy. And he will. And see... There has to be a time in your life when you commit your heart to him in childlike faith. And if you're ready to do that or you'd like to do that, I'd like to pray with you right now. By praying with me, you are literally saying before God, I want to be a real Christian. I want to be ready. I don't understand everything about the Bible, Tiff. I don't understand everything about Bible prophecy. But down deep in my heart, I want to live ready to meet the Lord. That is where you begin with God. And when we pray together, when we're done, everybody is somebody to God. You're important to God. You're important to me. You're important to our ministry. And I want you, when you're done praying, to go to lostlamb.org, lostlamb.org, one word, and then click on New Beginnings and follow the easy prompts. And if you're able, take a time to write me a brief email and just say, Tiff, I prayed with you that night, and our ministry will follow up on you because everybody's somebody to God. And if you need to pray that prayer, if you're in this auditorium, and you need to pray that prayer. Maybe it's the first time you've prayed that prayer. Maybe you're away from God and you need to come home. You can come home. Let's pray together right now. Just say out loud, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I admit my sin. I believe in Jesus Christ. And I confess him now as my Lord and as my Savior. With the blood you shed upon the cross, purify my mind, my body, and my spirit, and make me holy in your eyes. I vow this day I will serve the Lord all the days of my life. And in place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to be what you want me to be. And now by the promise of God, I am no longer the property of sin. I am tonight 
a child of God, and I'll never be the same. I am saved. I am healed. I am delivered. I belong to Jesus. In his name I pray. And all God's people shouted amen and amen. Come on and praise him one more time.